Hello, America, and uh, welcome to the Glenn Beck program and to the Blaze. It's Mr. Rigby. This is Marcus Luttrell's dog. This is the network that you're building. Today, I want to talk a little bit about post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, but more importantly, I want to talk to you about the commitment you and I made to ourselves on 9-11 and how this fits in with the news of the day. I am more and more disturbed by this um, story of Chris Kyle um, as each day goes by. There's no greater act of love than, you know, if, if you would decide to lay down your life for another. I think that's why we like dogs so much. When there's trouble in the house, they don't even think of themselves, they just, they go. Chris Kyle dedicated his life to this country. And when he was done serving on the battlefield, he came home. And then he continued his life of service. His mission was to help fellow battle-torn soldiers cope with coming home. If he chose to stay at home um, and make a lot of money, he'd be alive today. And he'd probably be a wealthy man. He would have been a wealthy man if he just would have taken the royalties from his book, but he didn't. He gave every dime of them up because he cared about his brother in arms. Our country owes this man and men like him more than we can possibly repay. So how do we show our appreciation? Well, I think in two ways. One, by changing our behavior. And two, a more temporal fix, I guess. This morning I, I went on the air and um, we were at $41,000 uh, raised for his family and for his um, foundation. I asked Mercury One uh, yesterday to help out. And so we set up the website. 100% of the proceeds um, go to help the family out. We, we set a $500,000 goal and I think it would be nice to overwhelm this family with love and gratitude and then also send a clear message. It's going to be us that fix this. 100% of the proceeds go to Kyle, Kyle's foundation to help soldiers with uh, PTSD and to the Kyle family. His wife Taya and their two young children, six and eight years old. He didn't spend an awful lot of time with them. He didn't get a lot, of ch a lot of chances. In the three years since he's been home, he spent about six months of that time at home. The rest of the time, he has been working to help. Last night, Marcus um, and a few friends, grieving friends, Marcus Luttrell and his wife, another current Navy SEAL, mother of a fallen SEAL, and uh, Chris Kyle's brother, Jeff, came here to these studios after we finished the show and they had to do a, a stupid thing on CNN uh, and then they issued a statement. And all of them are dealing with the tragic loss of somebody very close to them. And that's hard enough. It's hard enough to digest because it was senseless. He was murdered. He was trying to help somebody and he was murdered. His whole life was about helping and standing up. But it's not supposed to end like this. It's tough enough to take for a family if he's killed overseas, but at least that one you saw coming. This one you didn't. And then to have your fellow countrymen so flippantly throw out words, the media, and those who have an agenda, that only makes it even more mind-boggling. The misinformation and vicious attacks are incomprehensible. I responded to Ron Paul on the radio today. You can check that response out at theblaze.com. I'll tell you that I sat at the table and I asked a few questions and I'm not even gonna ask the questions or reveal the answers that were happening at the dinner table because they're not mine to um, release. But I can tell you this, 
What you're seeing in the media is not the true story. Chris was not treating somebody with a disorder. That's not what he was doing, as alleged by Ron Paul and the media. And those people who are taking that false report and using the death of an American hero to sanctimoniously trumpet a set of foreign policy beliefs is subhuman. If your first reaction after hearing about an American war hero dying is to dance on their grave in order to make a political point, and a really crappy one at that, you should be beyond shamed of yourself. After today's radio show, I went upstairs to my office and I read some of the email. And these people are out of their mind nuts. Um, some of the hateful things that they're saying, and these are the people that are supposed to be on our side. And people who are saying, oh, Glenn Beck, he says he's a libertarian. What? 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 What is it this time? What is it I'm not libertarian enough for you? I mean, who are you to dictate what that even means? If, if, if it's, I'm not libertarian enough because I support the troops while calling for an end to the war, that doesn't make me libertarian? Okay. If libertarian means that you don't support veterans and people that you sent off to battle in your name, even though it wasn't you, it was your country, and then you cheer when one of them is murdered and gunned down in the streets, then you so grossly misdefine the word libertarian that you, my friend, are the one lost in the battle fog of the French Revolution. Our soldiers have nothing to do with the policies. I honestly don't know how they do it, but they do. The men and women of our military did not enlist to live by the sword. To reduce military service to nothing more than some barbaric lust for violence is the ultimate insult and the ultimate lie about the American soldier. I don't know why they all enlist. I know they're different than me. They're braver than me. I don't think they love the country more than me. But I think they understand duty and honor more than I do. And they serve our country and our Constitution with their dying breath. Their honor is at times so overwhelming, it takes away your breath. Here they are. Somebody who signs up, eager 20-year-old kid with high ideals, where were you? Ready to lay it all on the line and just, I don't know, protect and defend the Constitution, protect and defend their family, what? I don't know. Most of us can't even comprehend what it really means to protect and defend the Constitution or our families, let alone risk everything for it. They do. Freedom, as we found out on 9-11, is an extraordinarily fragile thing. And so many of us don't even know what it takes to defend it. We take the people who defend it for granted. Well, they'll do it. Just send them. We don't even give it a second thought. Leave it to the soldier. And when we call them, no matter how insane it might be, no matter how long it goes on, you think you're tired of the war? How do you think they feel? They go. Some fly. Some are on ships. Some are in offices. Some are on supplies. But they're the ones who get thrown directly into the belly of the beast. There are those that visit the enemy where they live. I'm never... I get spooked by caves on my own property. I'm not going from cave to cave where dirtbag terrorists are. They do. They go building to building, cave to cave, banging on death's door. Which one comes out? They bust in not knowing what's on the other side. Sometimes it's just a scared family. Sometimes it's a terrorist ready to fight. Sometimes you don't know if it's a terrorist or a family. You don't know because the terrorist is a family. The soldier is required to make a snap decision that you and I cannot make. Is that an innocent kid? If not, do I kill the kid? If I do, am I sure it's not an innocent kid? Do I kill this mother who's acting suspiciously? Here they come. Here they come. What do I do? What do I do? You and I'd wet our pants. 
This is the decision that people like Chris Kyle faced all the time, every day. While you and I were watching American Idol, he wasn't. He was running Overwatch, charged with protecting a group of Marines. When he spotted a woman acting suspiciously, what do you do? He writes about it at the very beginning of his book. He says, I looked through the scope. Marines are coming, said my chief. As the building began to shake, keep watching. I looked again through the scope. The only people who were moving were the woman and maybe a child or two nearby. I watched our troops pull up. Ten young, proud Marines in uniform got out of their vehicles, gathered for foot patrol. As the Americans o organized, the woman took something from beneath her clothes and yanked at it. She had set a grenade. I didn't realize it at first. Looks yellow, I told the chief, describing what I saw as he watched himself. It's yellow, the body of, she's got a grenade, said the chief. It's a Chinese grenade, crap. Take the shot, but shoot. Get the grenade, the Marines. I hesitated. Someone was trying to get the Marines on the radio, but we couldn't reach them. They were coming down the street, heading towards the woman. Shoot, said the chief. I pushed my finger against the trigger. The bullet leapt out. I shot. The grenade dropped. I fired again as the grenade blew up. It was the first time I'd killed anyone while I was on the sniper rifle, and the first time in Iraq, and the only time I killed anyone other than a male combatant. Making those decisions day in and day out has got to take something out of you. We are not born to kill each other. And when you do, it has to take something out and stay with you forever. Especially if the country can't decide if they're even in the war for good or bad reasons. Marcus Luttrell in Lone Survivor did the same thing. He and his team agonized whether or not they should kill a goat herder and his son they prayed as they approached, please, 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 please don't look down. And they did, and they spotted them, and then they had to make a decision. A goat herder and his son stumbled on their recon location. A friend of mine told me, because I asked a stupid question, I hate hanging out with Military guys, I hate it, quite honestly. I love these guys, and I hate hanging out with them. Because I feel, I mean, I always feel like the biggest girl. You should have seen me at the Super Bowl, but I always feel like the biggest girl. But I feel like a total worthless human being running around these guys. And I asked one of them, I was standing in my kitchen one time, and I asked one of them, what does it feel like to be in hand-to-hand -hand combat? He told me, both soldiers know it's going to be one or the other. And there comes a moment when the tide turns and you look in his eyes and something changes. You can see the exact moment when he realizes <gasps> it's going to be him that dies. He told me that's a look he'll never forget. War is hell. It's not a movie. Even if you survive, the scars have to last forever. They last on the outside of the body. Feelings of such intense... Feelings. I don't even know what they are. Shame, guilt, questions. I have no idea. Moral injuries have got to be more damaging than physical wounds because we're not built to do these things. These feelings you don't leave on the battlefield. Watching the Super Bowl at home doesn't make them go away. Our soldiers need your help. They have helped us. While we tried our best to make sense of what was going on, they got the job done. And then what do they get? They get a medal, an occasional thanks at the airport,
and a doctor handing them a piece of paper with some prescriptions on it. After all, better living through pharmaceuticals, right? When our guys get back and they're having a hard time, the first place we send them is to the doctor's office, because really, who can understand what a war-torn soldier is going through better than a pencil-pushing, prescription-happy doctor? After all, he went to some of the best universities in the world. A guy who's most likely never served on the battlefield. Might have served in the military, but has he gone cave to cave? The guy will ask some the same stupid form questions, pretending to listen to the answers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how would you feel about that? The outcome's already determined because he's going to be diagnosed with PTSD. And then, he, then the doctor will go and break out the magic little prescription pad that unlocks the gates to the wonderful world of pharmaceuticals. Oh, pharmaceuticals having nightmare? Here, have some Ambien. Feel a little sad about having to make that decision about the woman in the street? Have some Prozac. By the way, your name is now on a list with people with psychiatric problems, and the president is currently trying to take away guns from those kinds of people. You know, but don't worry, don't worry. And then don't worry about trying to protect your family without any guns. Just take some more pills. Don't worry about the side effects like nausea, a blurred vision, seizing, uh, uh, vomiting, hallucinations, or suicidal thoughts. I love that one. Wow, you're giving me something to help me because I'm having suicidal thoughts, and one of the drawbacks is I might have suicidal thoughts. Yes, but if you experience any of these, call your doctor immediately. Oh, good. Can you fill out another form? Why? So he can give you another wonder drug? Our soldiers don't need wonder drugs. First thing they need is an end to the red tape. But they also need us to understand that I think we can't really help them. They need each other. The only way I can possibly relate to this is I'm a recovering alcoholic. And let me tell you something. I went to a bunch of those doctors. Oh, I could run circles around doctors. There's a, Who's a better liar? Who's a better liar about me than me? I can lie to a doctor all day long. But you know who I can't, who I can't get past? An alcoholic. Because he was the greatest liar about him. And so I can sit in a room with an alcoholic, and I, I mean, I can do it in two minutes. I can hear an alcoholic, and they're like, ah, let me tell you something. And I'll be like, okay, that's, you're full of crap. Because I've been there. Whether he knew it or not, I think he did. That's what Chris Kyle was doing. In a way, kind of going through the 12 steps, listening, being a friend, not trying to cure anything at a gun range, just being there, someone who could relate. Chris Kyle had been through hell. Is it so bad that maybe he was just trying to help fill the empty time of a fellow vet who was struggling and help him remember the positive experiences of when he held a gun? You people in New York will never understand, but anybody who's ever fired a gun for sport does. I'll never understand the soldier but anyone who has ever been through it does. Maybe Chris knew the best part of medicine was being there. Only somebody who's been through it is helpful. Honestly, it's why I've never asked my good friend Marcus Luttrell what happened when he was in captivity. The curious side of me the spectator in me, I suppose, has always wanted to ask, but I never have, and I never will. And here's why. What the hell do I need that information for? What good is going to come from him telling? What good could I possibly get out of it? And what good would he ever get out of it telling me? Whatever happened, is not something I can possibly relate to or help. And honestly, neither can a doctor with all of his really super smart textbooks. It's why so many people who are going through their own personal hell, whatever it is, doesn't tell the truth to their doctor. 
you drink or do drugs to cover something up. It's a band-aid. Drugs and whatever only masks. And turning our vets into over-drugged, emotionless zombies is not the answer. Let me ask the same question I asked when we bailed out the banks. Is this really the best we can do? Really? That's it? That's it? Because that's what they did for the banks. They just wrote a prescription for more money. Don't worry about it. Oh, you didn't do anything wrong. Don't worry about it. Is this the best we can do? Really? Is this what we've come up to? Where nobody takes any kind of responsibility? Didn't we ask these guys to go in our name? Haven't they been there over and over and over again? Didn't they put their ass on the line for us? And in return, what? Here, take two of these and call me in the morning. It's a disgrace. It's a national disgrace. We have an obligation to the people who have done things in our name, whether we agree or not. We have an obligation to stop the war, to stop creating more wars, to learn the lessons of the past. We have an obligation. Human beings are not built to wage perpetual war with multiple deployments. Back in the 1980s, I worked with a Vietnam veteran. He still carried the emotional scars from how poorly he was treated when he returned home. He was proud of his service, but the country wasn't. I made a promise to myself. At that time, I was really young. I will never be part of a generation or a group of Americans that do that to our soldiers. So if you're a longtime listener of mine, you remember that after the decision was made to go into Iraq, before the war started, I went across the country and held rallies called Rallies for America. They were called by the media pro-war rallies. They weren't. What I talked about at every single one of those stops was whether or not you agreed with the war, the decision was made, and now that our troops were going into battle, we had to dedicate to ourselves that when it was over, when they would come home, we would treat them as heroes. At that time, I really thought that we just, we shouldn't spit on them. That we shouldn't call them baby killers. You know, easy stuff. <laughs> At least this time around, it's easy. Boy, the last generation had a hard time with that one. But I was wrong. I thought respect would be enough. If people weren't calling them names or spitting on them, everything would be okay. But that's not it. Because we think we're treating our veterans right, we are allowing another generation of Vietnam to happen. We have to not only pressure our so-called leaders in Washington to cut the red tape. Drop everything you're doing in Washington. Will you get these guys the help that's required? But we also have to pressure our state leaders. And if our state leaders don't do it, then we have, to, we have to pressure our churches. The government has failed them on the battlefield. What do you say we don't fail them on the home front? Because we've always used the excuse, we can't do anything about it. Washington can, but this one, we can do something. And this one, we will be held eternally responsible for. Each of us do what we can. I told you a few minutes ago that my stated goal at Mercury One was $500,000 to raise that money for his family. He has nothing and the vultures have flown in. Jesse Ventura wants to, is suing this family. He wants the money. They don't have any money. We're putting this money in a trust so no vulture could ever get it. But $500,000, I don't think is enough. I'd like to set a goal of a million dollars. I don't know if we can make it, but it's worth a try. Some of it will go to help those with PTSD. 
in real programs, not in governmental waste programs. And by the way, Washington, don't talk to me about how there isn't any money. You know, the economy is bad. Oh, we're spending so we have no money. If you can scrape up $650 million on digital TV converter box coupons or $6 billion to make federal buildings green or $850 million for Amtrak or $1.2 billion for youth activities. Here's a youth activity for you. Go talk to a vet. Find out who they are. We're spending hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer money on abortions and distributing the morning after pill. Let me see if I have this right. How could you possibly look into our veterans' eyes when you say through your actions? Well, I mean, we wanted to make sure the teens were allowed to have unprotected, uh, unprotected sex on the weekends. But if that happened to fail, we also wanted to pay for their abortion. I don't personally care if all federal buildings from coast to coast are burning styrofoam cups for heat. Or if Amtrak, boo-hoo, goes out of business. It should have gone out of business a long time ago. Have you, ever read, uh, have you ever written on it? It sucks. And I'm pretty sure that the youth of America doesn't need $1.2 billion so they can find something to do in the summer. Grab a shovel. Meet a neighbor. Grab a rake or a lawnmower. You and I found out what to do in the summer. What do you say? Can we respect them enough just to have them figure it out themselves? Let me put this into perspective one last time. The vets that we're talking about, most of them signed up right after 9-11. While you and I we signed up to figure out what was going on with our, countries, uh, our country. This, these guys went out to battle. Forgive me for saying that I am tired. What do you say? We help them out by changing our attitude. Maybe that's, maybe that's what we can do that will make this, let this murder make some sort of sense. By beginning to look into and then understanding the solution to the problem isn't slapping everyone with a disorder label and then giving them some pills. What do you say we learn from Chris Kyle, who possibly understood this better than any of us could have? And they're in the hospital, and they're supposed to be either doing, you know, healing physically or emotionally. It sucks to be trapped somewhere. So just being able to get out and about and only be surrounded by vets. You don't have to worry about some psychiatrist or a doctor or something. You're just out there, one with the guys again, having fun, cutting up. And it's just being the outdoors, it seems to really progress their healing process, and they get along so much faster to where the hospitals are, have now said, you know, whenever you want them, you just take them. Because when they come back, they're on a high for about two or three weeks. I would love for people to be able to, when they think of me, think of, you know, here's a guy who stood up for what he believed in and helped make a difference for the vets. You know, somebody who cared so much about them that he wanted them taken care of. You've seen it in movies, but what's it really like to be in battle? Join Lieutenant Dave Grossman, whose books On Killing and On Combat are required military reading. Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern, The Life of a Soldier. <laughs> Bill Potter, former Army Lieutenant and Vietnam veteran, joins me. Also, former Navy SEAL Pete Scobell. Bill and Pete are the co-founders of R4 Alliance, a veteran support group. Also joining is a good friend of mine, um, former Navy SEAL, Marcus Luttrell. He is uh, the lone survivor, the author of the book Lone Survivor, soon to be a new movie, and the author of the book Service. Um, okay, so let, let's just, let's take this because um, this is what I, this is the question I get from all my New York friends. Well, why would he ever take him out to the, uh, the gun range? Because that, that's crazy. Marcus? <sighs> Well, from what I understand, um, Chris had been having a couple of conversations with his mother when he wanted to pick his kids up and drop his kids off. And he was saying, hey, you know, my son is an ex-Marine. Uh, he's been co cooped up in the house. He just wants to get out. He's been having some problems and stuff like that. And he's like, do you mind hanging out with him, spending some time with him and whatnot? 
And Chris was like, sure, yeah, you know, I'll do that. And Chris had just gotten a couple of new weapon systems, and that's the way Chris kind of blew off some steam. He'd go to the, to the, uh, to the range and, and, and fire some weapons, and he just invited the kid over. He's like, hey, you know, you're an ex-Marine. You want to go? Uh, it's probably been a while since you shot some weapons. Uh, you know, I know you've been cooped up in the house. We're going to go down there, me and my buddy. Why don't you come along with us? It's kind of like, um, I mean, first of all, <laughs> There's nothing that blows off steam like firing weapons. It is the best. Um, the, the, the second part is, is it, it, you know, when you fall off a horse, right? You, you get back on the horse, but not if, not, not if the person is like, why, not if they have all broken ribs and, you know, broken bones, but he didn't know right. that he was broken up inside. Yeah. Other than just, it's, it's, can you explain, because you said earlier, don't say PTSD. Can you explain what this is? Because it's not the same as those people who said, I saw the World Trade Center fall, right? Right. I mean, post-traumatic stress disorder, the D is, is very, uh, I don't think it give, does, doesn't do it justice. It, it, gives some, it gives people the ability to label. Stress is stress. And post-traumatic stress is, you know, really, you, you, call it, you can call it shell shock. You can call it, um, um, what's it? dysregulation of your parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system you can call it you can call what it I whatever call it. you want but at the end of the day <laughs> but at the end of the day it's, it's it's uh it's all the same stuff and it's really you're but you it's know. not the same is it the same as somebody who's witness i see a car crash and they they label me with you know pts and it's not the same as what you went through is it no, it's different for everybody. I mean, and I think everybody handles stress differently. And the, the, I think the problem is, is when they're coming back, a lot of these veterans and the, the doctors, and they're, they're talking about, all right, he's got post-traumatic stress disorder. It's like, yeah, you know, I've been through a stressful situation. Of course, I'm going to have some stress. I had stress okay. my whole, you know, whole right. life. Getting through high school was stressful. My, every every was doctor stressful. I ever go to, they say, "How's your stress level?" And I'm like, "What do you think? I'm building a network." And <laughs> George Soros hates my guts. How do you think my stress is? But that's the way it is. Yeah. That's the way I live. Um, when I first met you, could you please tell a little bit of your story? Because you would go out to the car and you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even know why you got in the car. Yeah, I, I, I drove to work one day and I think that's what kind of tipped it off for me was I, I drove to work. Um, I didn't know how I got there. I basically was sitting in the parking lot. It was a Sunday and I was looking around and, uh, just a little confused and then my cell phone texted and it was my wife and, and it was hey where are you you went to the grocery store um, which was 10 minutes up the road and work was 30 minutes away and that was a moment when I came back and you know, I came home and I, I didn't tell her where I was we fought because where were you where were you well I don't know where I was right and that was when you know we started I started realizing hey there's something there's something wrong you ask for help and everyone goes well you're just like everybody else okay <laughs> What's that? You go to the you go to the psych and you say, "Hey, I, I'm I'm having some cognitive issues." Well, what's a cognitive issue? Like, you know, I don't, driving places I don't know. I'm, I can't even read an email. Um, I can't pay attention long enough to get through an email. I've got uh, splitting headaches. And they say, "Well, what was the event?" You go, "I don't know what the event was." And then, you know, it pushed me to the point of where I, I resigned. And it wasn't until, you know, I finally hit that breaking point where I fought with my wife got in the car and I drove to his brother's house and I just you know I just dumped on him and Morgan very nonchalantly just said oh yeah you got TBI you need you need to go to NICO I was like what? what's yep. TBI what's what's NICO what is this and that was you know that was the tipping point for me because it was an answer well what is it and then it became a that's you know that, that was the tipping then I finally asked for Hey, I need some more help. Where, where is this place? How do I get that help? I kind of felt empowered because there was a there was an answer that was out there, and I just got to go find it now. When you when you told me that story, um, it really pissed me off because um, you're going for help and that nobody recognized it, and um, you know the red tape in the military has got to be ugly, and you don't necessarily want to tell everybody everything and uh, and nobody was nobody was there you had to go to his brother I met your brother uh, I'll go to your brother for medical advice faster than you but that's <laughs> a scary trip going to their their house uh, <laughs> but it's you, you know you ask you ask earlier it's the same thing I, I I haven't seen Marcus in a while we walk in the room and I feel comfortable 
I yeah. feel comfortable sitting on the couch with him. I feel comfortable, that's why I spend time with, with Bill. You have a, an instant kind of, well, last night when I, or a couple of nights ago when, um, when Stuby was on, and you asked, hey, if you were you know, pick anybody in this room to go to combat with, and I immediately said, I pick Stuby, right. even though he's wounded, beat up, blown up, I, there's you an understanding him. of what Stuby's gonna do for me, uh, sight unseen, without question. And I think that goes back to the comfort that, hey, I got a brother up the road, he's having some issues, we're gonna go fire some rounds. One guy's, ba one guy's you know, gun is another guy's basketballs, and is an, uh, it's just, it's his place, it's, his, it's where you can find your flow. And hey, let's get him out there, let's, let's reintegrate him, let's, let's wake him up a little bit. Okay, back in just a second. So we were talking with Marcus and he's, when we, soon we go in the break, he says, you know, the real problem is, is that we've lost our buddies. We're used to that, right? That you're separate from each other. Right. I mean, the guys that we come up through training with, we, we go into our teams with, we deploy into combat with, and we spend all this time with, we, we, we go through these scenarios with, and, and, and that's how we can com com communicate with each other. And we, we solve our problems. You know, we don't have these doctors or anything like that. It's just like guys that I've gone through this with, I'm like, hey, man, how are you dealing with this? He's like, oh, it's, uh, I'm just to take care of it. I'm like, all right, good. I'm kind of adopting that. But then, I mean, the hardest thing for me was when I, I was – out of the community when I got out of the SEAL teams, it's, uh, I just kind of beat my head against the wall forever. I, I was stressed out so much because I was knew what I was supposed to do for a living. I was supposed to be a Navy SEAL, and that's a lot of times where it all comes flooding in because you're you're going through the emotions. I mean, they're all always there, especially like when we sit around, we, we tell stories, and as soon as like if, as soon as Pete comes in the room and I sat and we sat down, I just immediately got comfortable because I've gone through all this stuff with him. I can relate to him. And when you don't have that, you don't have that person with you anymore. That's where the stress comes in because you don't have anybody to vent it to, and, and, you're, and you're not around it. And you don't have anybody, and, and it's just. So what happened? To, what is the difference between the World War II generation and the Vietnam and this generation? I mean, because my uncle Leo landed on the beaches of uh, Normandy. He never spoke about it, not a word, until I met him. You know, 60, 70 years later. Well, one of the main reasons is that, uh, is that uh, on the battlefield, um, uh, soldiers are surviving injuries that they never, never survived before. And um, uh, what the heck, I mean, in, 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 in uh, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, uh, they didn't have the military hospitals. They right. didn't have the field hospitals. We're better so, at saving people you know, than yeah, ever we, before. We don't, we, 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 we don't have the, uh, uh, you know, we didn't have the transportation to get, to, you know, to, to, to get the wounded off the battlefield. Now we do. Uh, we have better, better body armor, we have better helmets, we have better everything, um, you know, that can protect the, the core. Well, the, uh, uh, the, the explosions and the, uh, is, and, is, and, is, and, the, and the other injuries are the ones that are, t are, that, are, that, that are taking the toll now. So it's, I mean, it's so, it's so like us as a country, but also as a government, to take care of the body but not look inside at all. So who is doing anything to look on the inside? Is the government doing, are they doing anything Okay. This good. is that. This is that issue. But, but you know, when you talk about what do you do, what's the best thing to do? I, my my personal opinion, and, and and this is Bill's opinion as well, uh, is that there's a there needs to be a partnership between public and private. The private sector can move at light speed. The public sector, you know, the worst thing that can happen right now is that we we increase awareness and everyone calls up their congressman and the VA budget gets doubled, the bureaucracy triples, it's not the and everyone slips through the cracks. The answer is this network of charities um, and these private organizations like the Intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund uh, that built the NICO Center. You know. Okay, okay, so let me take a quick break, come back and then tell me specifically if somebody was watching how they could, where they could donate or where they could go for help or, or something like that, back in a minute. I mean, that's, that's why a lot of us. No? I mean, we're just talking about if there is any, is there anything to this that when you come back, you've done all these things and you're proud of what you've done. And you're doing a great job and you come back and you're like, the country's like, well, like Vietnam. Eh, I'm well, not really yeah, sure right. if it's right. 
it, it certainly wasn't right, and uh, and that's one of the reasons I got involved with uh, with this with this with this generation only because uh, I, I was absolutely convinced that that as long as I'm breathing, uh, this 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 generation is not going to experience the stuff that we generate that, that, that was generated when, when when we took off our uniforms. Matter of fact, we couldn't wait to get out of our uniforms because we were so so unwelcome coming home. And, uh, uh, and, and, that, and that, that has troubled me for several years. Now it's payback time and I can, I can help these guys. So what is, what is Higher Ground in Sun Valley? Higher Ground is, a, is an organization that I joined about two years ago. Uh, very special staff, very special group of people. The uh, Haley, Idaho, uh, the Sun Valley area is, uh, is, is a small community. Um, uh, they, they have developed this program where we bring in uh, squad size, because that's the, that's the lowest common denominator in the military other than self, uh, but, but, but that's the lowest, you know, the lowest common denominator right. as, far as, you know, as, as, as far as organization is concerned. We bring in squad size uh, uh, groups and their, and their, their caregiver uh, for a week of, uh, of, of a specialized sport. Um, we specialize now in, in, uh, in, in whitewater sports, mountain sports, fly fishing. Uh, fly fishing is one of the more, more tranquil things that you can ever do. Yeah, I don't know, I I don't know if anybody knows, you know, I don't know if you know oh, about I know. it. I, I love it. You know, there, there's, nothing more, there's nothing more tranquil than standing in the middle of a, 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 of a stream. Whether you catch fish or not is totally immaterial. It's amazing how you just, everything else disappears. Absolutely. And, 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 there's, and there's no better therapy for these, you know, for, 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 for these kids and their caregivers to go out and share an experience like this. Uh, part of the camp as well is, 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 is uh, we have psychologists on board. We have, we, sh we show them yoga, we show them breathing, we show them relaxation. And the most important thing that we do is that we follow up with them for three years. Look, can you tell me about Nico real quick? We only have about a minute or so. Tell me what yeah, happened. Basically, the, the, so 2007, I'll give you a little background real quick. 2007, Department of Defense says, hey, we want a center of excellence on traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. No money for it. We're spending a billion dollars a day in Iraq, but we can't cough up 75 million bucks to build this facility. Trepid Fallen Heroes Fund and Mr. Fisher built the Fisher houses. He went out and said, we don't need your help. He raised the money. And he built this, and it was the idea was it would be the first center of excellence dedicated to the study of traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. Okay, when you went there, you met with all of the doctors one all time. All of the doctors. So you one told time. your story one time. One time, and they said, "Hey, you're broke. We can fix you." And that was the that was the the hope that I needed, and that's what changed everything for me. Which is which is kind of the way. I mean, the hope not only comes from we can fix you, but also the the that there's that it's not red tape because when you were out. I mean, that's what you look to each other say and say, don't worry, we're going to fix it, right? Mm. Yeah. So that's where the, I mean, that kind of connected? It was, it was that empowerment. When, it, when I asked for help and I went in the door and they said, hey, we can do that, now I'm empowered. Where you go to the, you know, from what I, my experience is, it's, the VA is a big bureaucracy and bureaucracies, you know, yeah. cease to be self-licking ice cream cones. Yeah. They suck. They don't cease to be. They are self-licking right. self ice cream right. cones, and that's what that's what ends up happening. Nyko was there to, hey, here's the problem, here's the solution, and this is how we're going to get there. That's how you once you empower an individual, once you empower a vet, a guy like us, you can accomplish anything. It's that. Okay, um, we're going to put on the um, website um, uh, things, all, all different uh, things, ways you can help, including the Lone Survivor Foundation and MercuryOne.org. We urge you to go there um, and donate if you can. Back in a minute. Week of good shows still left. Make sure you join us tomorrow night. We'll see you on the radio tomorrow from Dallas. Good night, America.